Have there been tests with no-till systems and zinc drawdown? Not that I know of. Um, in no-till systems, we can see an accumulation of phosphorus and zinc in the very surface, uh, because depending on the length of drawdown and you know how high those nutrients were before um, starting no-till. Um, but I haven't seen any any literature out there on drawdown in no-till systems. Uh, but if you are seeing some zinc toxicity issues that incremental sampling can help you really decide whether a one-time tillage might be beneficial to help redistribute some of those nutrients and also get some lime down in there while you're at it. We had a question in the, in the chat and uh, I think a, a very interesting one. Why after five years regarding the drawdown study, why after five years the, the drawdown reduces in terms of the, the, the exports? Um, and, and the thing is that when you have a very rich soil where the plants will have the luxury consum consumption and so they would export more phosphorus in the beginning. And also we can expect that after some years we have some transformation of phosphorus in less available phosphorus like the phosphorus fixation. And so we expect that they will reduce the speed of drawdown after some years. Yeah, that was a really good question. We also had a couple others if you want to um, address the next one, Luke. How much of the P drawdown is due to loss to the environment? Yeah, uh, in, in those studies, none of them uh, were working with uh, evaluating phosphorus losses. And so um, you know, we don't have this information. And uh, what were considered were just the, the, the reducing uh, the phosphorus in the soil based on the, the crop export. And, and, but we don't know. We don't know. You know, none at all. And where will the manure go if pea drawdown is desired? Oh, the biggest question of all time, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you jump on that? <laughs> well, <laughs> that is the question. That is the. Uh, um, the goal of a lot of manure management technologies is trying to consolidate phosphorus for export um, and make it a little more cost effective. I will say that I've been um, encouraged by two different scenarios in North Carolina. One is um, they are mining the sludge out of uh, our swine lagoons and there's some farms that are using greenhouses for solar drying and they're drying it to about a 90% um, dry matter content, which allows it to be exported so much farther, uh, considering it was at one point less than 10% dry matter. Um, and so that's been really encouraging. And there's some industries, um, that some, some crop industries that are very excited about that product. A uh, great thing is that there's uh, no odor. Um, and it's a rich phosphorus product. Um, another one is the combustion of poultry litter, which may sound very counterintuitive, um, but there are energy credits in North Carolina that allow us to co-combust um, poultry litter and wood uh, byproducts. And that material, the, the ash byproduct from that is actually uh, being transported to um, a different part of the state. Uh, and they're very excited because it's a low-cost fertilizer source for them. Um, and that material is taking phosphorus out of the equation where it's being generated and moving it to a different uh, part of the landscape. And so those are two specific scenarios that I'm seeing in North Carolina that have me excited. Um, but those are, they're, they're very small at this point as far as total amount of manure being um exported and, and transported at this time. Again, North Carolina is producing, is one of the densest manure pr producing states in the country. Um, and so it's it's difficult for us, um, but we do have some, some things that are being done that I think are, are going to have an impact in the future. Additionally, in the Piedmont and in the mountains, um, it, west the western side of the state we do have a lot of soils that actually need phosphorus and so uh, there could be some opportunity for redistribution uh, but the 
the uh, markets and and every all the connections there um, are are not are not quite built to make that happen. Um, Corrine or Augustine, do you want to comment on that one? Where will the manure go if P drawdown is is desired from the New York perspective? Yeah, I think it it goes in line with what you indicated. Um, I think um, in in general in dairy systems here in New York, we had a little bit uh, less of a challenge, but um, than other livestock industries that import more more uh, or higher quantities of pea through feed, for example, and from farther away. Uh, but it's still a challenge. In in um, there are a lot of extension programming going on to, um, yeah, basically for help producers recognize the value of manure and, and calculate exactly, you know, how much, uh, how far they can haul it uh, economically. And, and and that's a big piece of it. And, and definitely the treatment, which is not quite there yet, I would say in the state. Um, yeah, definitely. All right, we have some other questions. Um, I think this is in response to Quirin's talk. Um, the first question was actually, uh, you don't have a spot for uh, under supply of phosphorus. And I think they were talking about your green box where it doesn't have a bottom. There's no bottom where you would essentially be mining phosphorus from the system. Can you comment on why there was no P drawdown level that you identified there? Yeah, those green box figures actually do have that drawdown because that's everything that's below zero. Okay. And it is a sustainability management tool for the longer term, right? So in yep. the long term, we don't want to continue to mine our soils. Right. Therefore, the green box is between zero and some upper level. Gotcha. We can't we can't expect to be farming at 100% efficiency. Right. That doesn't exist nowhere in life, including not in agriculture. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Um, are there other commodity crops particularly sensitive to zinc? I am familiar with that with peanuts because they are a large commodity in North Carolina. I'm unaware of other crops that are particularly sensitive to zinc. Do you know of any, Luke? Yeah. Yeah, not that we know of, but I'm happy to look up some, some others and, and put those in the notes uh, of the webinar uh, at the end. Uh, does any state have a P drawdown best management practice to incentivize cooperators to draw down P availability in soils? That's a great question. Uh, does Cor does uh, New York have anything like that? So we have a New York phosphorus index and now also a Northeast region phosphorus index. And there is a... Uh, a description within our P index structure here for the Northeast that says that if you are in a situation where you're um, you're no longer able to recycle your nutrients on the land base, you are given a little bit of time to figure out what to do, but it has to go along with a drawdown system. So if you look at our PNX structure, it says uh, it, it's listed under incidental phosphorus applications in situations where you have no other choice, uh, where you have to start managing, and many of our states have agreed that you have to be in the green box of phosphorus to be able to allow to 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 go forward, and you have to put a drawdown strategy in place for any soil that tests over 160 pounds of phosphorus per acre on the Morgan or modified Morgan test. That is roughly equating to 35% P saturation, taking the Malik 3 phosphorus over iron and aluminum. So by definition in the structure for the P index, it says if you're over that 160 or 35% P saturation, no more phosphorus, unless you're totally in a bind. Um, as a whole farm with this issue, then you're given a little bit of time to figure out how to how to solve this over the longer term by implementing drawdown strategies for those fields that are over 160. Luckily in New York, we have very few fields in that category. 
The majority of our fields do need phosphorus. Yeah, that's a great position to be in. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one uh, specific to New York that I was hoping you could also answer. Uh, are there any pea extraction technologies successfully in use in New York, either on a research basis or at a commercial scale? Have any ideas that's, there? That's a that's a question for our manure management counterparts, our manure gotcha. treatment system counterparts. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of experimentation going. There are extraction methodologies that work, but might not be economically feasible or scalable okay. yet. Right. Um, there's a lot of work on going in this space and, and rightfully so I think we do need to invest in technologies that allow us to evaluate how we can get manure nutrients exported off a farm if it's a high density farm. For sure. Um, the next one was our North Carolina livestock operations required to test for soil pea and zinc as part of a nutrient management plan. Um, yes, they are. They are required to have a, a current soil test, which is every three years, required every three years. So um, we are required to test. Um, we do have specific thresholds for zinc where we're no longer allowed to apply manure. We also have thresholds for copper as well um, to make sure that we don't get to that sterilization stand or, or point. Um, but again, we're, we're starting to see some toxicity issues popping up um, even a little bit below that threshold. And so um, it's something that we're having to think about more and more. Have any of you seen a reluctance among farmers to reduce fertilizer application to the proportionate amount of nutrient application from manure? If so, how do you uh, help farmers resolve that reluctance? Anecdotally, I hear a lot of farmers who distrust the consistency of manure and nutrient content and apply fertilizer as an insurance policy. Um, yes, I believe all of us have had that similar situation. Um, I have found that a lot of farmers are hesitant to give up that starter fertilizer, that starter phosphorus fertilizer. I think Luke can really speak to that um, as well. But as far as the consistency, yes, a lot of people I have talked to um, who are unwilling to use manure say that it's not consistent enough and they don't want to have to worry about uh, whether the nitrogen is going to mineralize from the product. And so they like the guaranteed analysis of inorganic fertilizer. Um, and so what I have talked to uh, farmers a lot this year about is a, a dollars and cents uh, calculation of manure value, uh, how much money they can save by utilizing manure, um, and then really talking about the availability of those nutrients and trying to utilize the research that we have to, to back up um, the, the nutrient thresholds that we have when it comes to fertilizer recommendations. Um, Luke, do you want to talk about the uh, the, yeah. the phosphorus starter phosphorus conversation? I think that's a really good one when when discussing a topic like this. Yeah, I think all of us share the same uh, the, the same issues, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, it's very hard to uh, to convince uh, our stakeholders, our farmers, to not apply nutrients, uh, and it's very it's very easy to convince them when they have a soil test report that requires the application of uh, fertilizer. Everybody will follow that. But uh, sometimes when the, they have, well, the, the report tell them you don't need these nutrients, uh, we have the insurance policy <laughs> uh, in place because all farmers, they 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 like to have this insurance. And uh, um, it's interesting because we did a survey, uh, it was in 2022, because in 2022, we had a very interesting time with very high prices of fertilizers. And uh, I put a survey to, to my farmers to ask them, okay, if you don't need to apply phosphorus, and my folks are, uh, were phosphorus, if you don't need to apply phosphorus with these prices, it, uh, would you be willing to reduce or not applying this fertilizer? And uh, it was almost 100% that telling at least the starter phosphorus they would keep applying. And the starter phosphorus are those 20 pounds of P205 that they apply for corn uh, at planting. 
and nobody wants to get rid of that. Even that we have data in the state, we have uh, we have a lot of uh, trials, and we are running other trials, trying to see in which situations we have response to that starter phosphorus, and in very few situations we really need, but it is part of the uh, of the package uh, of nutrients, and so it's very hard to get rid of this in insurance policy. This, yeah. yeah. I think a common um, strategy that I utilize is, okay, you do, you're you unwilling to give up all of it. Are you willing to drop down by 10 to 15 pounds? Can you, can you just give me that where yeah. you try a little bit less? <laughs> and can yeah. we get somewhere with just a little, can we get to the same place with just a little bit less? And then, um, you know, if you can get people to test it out, test half a field. Yeah. Um, yeah, what, we, what we are doing here is we are putting on farm trials in these fields of uh, high levels of phosphorus and try to to show them uh, in terms of dollars you are spending money on these nutrients and you don't have any response to that. And uh, we are trying to communicate this in terms of what's the probability of response and the, the probability is always uh, always yeah. zero in those <laughs> in, all, in all those trials. But uh, I. I you know, it's 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 a long and and very slow movement that we need to do in terms of uh, uh, yes, trying absolutely. to get people into absolutely. this. Yeah, we have another question here that we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, for farms required to transition from a nitrogen balance to phosphorus balance on a whole farm basis, is nutrient recovery in manure such as separation, distillation, etc., a reasonable approach from an economic standpoint compared? to costs associated with exporting manure or adding additional acres. Uh, I think that really is going to be dependent on the cost of land in your area and whether there's any land available around your farm. I know in North Carolina, our swine farms are so close together that expansion of land is, is very rarely an option. We also have a lot of... Um, our rural lands are are turning into subdivisions, and so uh, land prices are are just going up and up. And so, um, it's really a um, an ROI cost analysis on on which one is going to be more effective and more reasonable as an option. Something I always tell my growers is just implementing a technology doesn't end the problem. You still, if you're Im implementing separation and you're used to pumping liquid, now you have to handle a solid. You also have to have people to handle those solids. You have to have people to haul the manure farther from the facility. So there are more than, it's just more than just one technology. It's it's managing that technology and managing that manure stream as well. Um, and so it really becomes a, a discussion of a, you know, whether they have the capabilities to do that and, and the cost comparison of the outlook from, from that perspective as well. Uh, Corrine, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I think you're right on target there. The, the, the farms that have high animal densities simply don't have the land base to recycle the nutrients. So export is a really good way to balance things out again. Um, we work with an industry, the dairy industry here, that has liquid manure by default, that tends to be bulky and difficult to transport. But if technology is there to cost effectively turn that into more manageable nutrient sources that can be exported off the farm, then there is a lot to say for, for investing research in, into that direction. And it's happening. It's definitely happening. Absolutely. Um, um, I, want, I want to brief, briefly come back to the, the start of phosphorus uh, question there too. Yeah. It was one of the questions that showed up the, the, the year I joined Cornell, 23 years ago now. That um, came up a lot, like farmers uh, wanting to be convinced about leaving phosphorus out of the starter. So we set up a statewide network at that time. Uh, Carl Zimmick, who was then with Prodairy and is now with Prodairy again here in New York, and I worked together on a statewide program. We had 90 on-farm trials, basically doing exactly, look what you were uh, describing, it's like putting out strips with and without, higher rates, lower rates, 
field days trying to figure out which one didn't get the phosphorus and it resulted in a drastic decrease in phosphorus fertilizer use in New York for those fields that tested above optimum on the soil test. So it was really being able to demonstrate that, farmers demonstrating it to themselves, consultants getting involved, building that network and having that message sort of travel by itself that mm -hmm. helped us go in that direction. And our, our statewide phosphorus use, fertilizer use is really low right now. Great. Yeah. The, the, great the great challenge for the, the starter is that it's very common to have phosphorus in, in the liquid, liquid starter. And so they need to move to a different type of fertilizer. And this, and uh, we have all the network of a uh, commercial network that have this, this material to, to put in the market. So um, we have a couple more questions uh, and we still have quite a few people on. So we'll keep going as long as y'all have time to be on here. Um, so how can communities or regional food systems support farms facing the challenge of managing phosphorus to prevent pollution? Are there examples of grant programs where the state pays in and can help bear this burden to increase, uh, increase adoption of nutrient recovery technologies or nutrient redistribution. Um, and yes, absolutely, there are state and federal programs uh, that uh, producers can be involved in. Um, when it comes to new technologies, uh, conservation innovation grants are something that um, producers can partner with universities to help demonstrate new technologies. And usually that's part of the, a company is part of that as well with, the, with a new technology. Um, there's also usually state and federal resources for cost share programs. So for instance, in North Carolina, we have the Soil and Water Conservation Commission, and we also have, um, or we have our local soil and water districts, and, and we have NRCS that both have cost share programs available. And so it goes, it varies by state as far as what their priorities are. Um, and how much money is available. And then also sometimes it, it varies by district as well, as far as the districts can sometimes set their own priorities. I think that depends on your state and, and how they're set up to distribute money. Um, but there are uh, cost share programs out there uh, to help assist in some of these things. Uh, something that um, producers might run into are lifetime uh, maximums. And so um, you know, we're looking at some of those right now in North Carolina, whether some of those lifetime maximums should be increased because, you know, if you really want to continue to have manure move to other areas, then you need to make sure that you have the ability to, to pay producers to actually do that. And so the lifetime max can be a real limitation on continuing in manure relocation efforts. Um, so that's something that has been kind of a barrier within that that system. But that's a great question. Um, are there any perspectives from anybody else that they'd like to share about redistribution efforts? Hearing none, I will see if we have any others. Um, We had one in the chat. I'm curious if composting is useful for nitrogen and or phosphorus mitigation in manures, and if so, how that works. Corrine, do you want to talk about comp Is composting common in New York? There are some farms that are composting and producing a product that then is exported and used by uh, more the home gardeners for horticultural organizations. Uh, Composts, if you are turning a manure into a compost that can be exported off the farm, it takes nutrients with it. Um, unfortunately, it uh, takes it um, in, a, in a different ratio. So you can export phosphorus with export of compost, but um, typically there is dairy compost, but typically there's very little nitrogen left in it and all of it is organic. So part of uh, the nutrients are still uh, lost from the farm before it's turned into compost and exported off that farm. So it's yes, it's a great technology or approach to exporting phosphorus. It's a little bit more difficult for nitrogen just because the composting process itself reduces 
the nitrogen content. Yeah, definitely from a dairy manure perspective, it reduces a lot of the moisture and the volume, which are two advantageous, adv advantageous outcomes uh, from composting. Uh, and so it is an effective phosphorus removal strategy because then you can transport it farther from the facility. But like Corrine said, you lose a lot of the nitrogen. And so you're losing a lot of the value um, associated with that. Um, as far as poultry is concerned, you usually don't see wide scale poultry uh, composting just because the high value of poultry litter comes from its high concentration of nitrogen. Um, and so we don't see that very common or, or very often in North Carolina because it is used primarily as a nitrogen fertilizer. And so you're losing that value when you um, compost it. Uh, we do have some people windrowing their um, bedding material and manure between flocks, which is partial composting. Um, and so that's probably blowing off a little bit of the nitrogen, but that's from an animal health perspective, trying to maintain disease and dry it out. Um, and so we don't see uh, much intentional composting, I'll say, uh, in the poultry industry. From a swine perspective, North Carolina, like I said, has anaerobic swine lagoons, so it's a wet-based system, and we're not uh, the the solids are being heavily digested within that that system. So composting wouldn't really it wouldn't really lend itself to being composted because a lot of the energy is already gone from it uh, in the digestion process. So uh, that's a little viewpoint of those three industries. Um, you know, as far as how composting might help, I see composting as being uh, most advantageous on dairy and um, and less for the other two. That's a good question.